there's never been blood that was spilt like yours. Because you bled every drop for us. Life poured out of you so we could have life. Jesus, we are forever grateful. That's why we're gathered here tonight. Because you poured out your blood. Lord, I pray as we get into your word, whether we've had a good day or a bad day, we would give you our attention. Because you are worthy of it all. Thank you for how you love us. Lord, give us ears to hear what you got to say to us today. And it's in the powerful, precious name of Jesus that we pray. And this church said, amen. Amen. Well, good evening, my friends. What's happening? It's a little dark still. There we go. If you have your Bible, let's go. Just go. Wherever you open, just shout it out. Did you go? (laughs) How about 1 John 3? Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord? Are you excited to be a part of worship? Isn't that beautiful? It just makes your day better already. I'm excited to share with you what the Lord has laid on my heart. And Miss Kim, it is a good to see you, girl. You look good, too. Buck been treating you right. That's what I'm talking about. We would have to scold him if you told us to. So, <laughs> First John 3, we'll be there in just a second. It's so good to see y'all. Thank you for coming to church. It's hump day. We don't stop doing that. Till we, you know, we're humping in here today, too. Humping on his word, amen. Don't take that crazy. So what happens when you see the truth of God's word played out in your life? When you've read something, you've prayed something, you've stood on something, you've built your family around something, you've you've raised your kids around something, and when you see it played out in your life and come to pass, what does that do for you in your heart? Does it build your faith? That's exactly what we've been doing on Wednesday night. We've been looking at different kinds of prophecies in in, in the Word of God and how it builds our faith. It gives us more trust in the Word of God, trust in the Lord, trust in what He says to us in prayer. It gives us more confidence. I don't know about you, but when I see something played out like it said it's supposed to, then it just builds my faith. Amen. So let's get some more meat off this bone. Two weeks ago, we were in this, this passage, but left a little meat on the bone. We was out of time, but let's, let's go back to it. 1 John 3, verses 10 and 11. You don't like to throw a chicken leg out if it's still got some meat on it, do you? Well, there's a whole lot of meat in this word. Start seeing this, this Bible, your Bible, as a chicken leg. How about that? Can you do that? Y'all crazy. I'm trying to get y'all stirred up a little bit. So in this, verse 10, in this, in this, in what he's about to say, the children of God and the children of the devil are made manifest. In other words, you're looking at children of God, you're looking at children of the devil, and you're about to be able to tell them apart, right? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Nor is he who does not love his brother, and you could add, is not of God. Now notice those two things right there. Someone who does not practice right things. Listen, do you do realize there's not one right thing about us? There's not one single right thing about us until Jesus come into our life. 
Because the word says we're nothing but filthy, nasty, bloody rags that were lapped, wrapped around a leper. That's all we are. That's our best. That's on your best day. That's when you were doing your best back in your prime. You were filthy rags. Me and you filthy rags. But Jesus come into our life. He changed our life. He set our feet up on a rock. He said that he became sin who knew no sin so me and you could become the righteousness of God. Okay? So there are, the, the, since we've become the righteousness of God, would not we practice those types of things? What we see from Jesus, we put those into practice, right? Well, the children of the enemy don't do that. Okay? They don't do that. They, 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 don't even, they don't even think about doing that. Okay? So this is how you would know that someone is a, is, is a children or the devil's offspring. Okay? Two things. He doesn't practice righteousness and he doesn't love his brother. All right? Watch verse 11. For this message that you heard from the very beginning, you could go all the way back to Genesis. It's been teaching that we should love one another. Right? That, that's, 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 that's the whole, everything hinges on love. If you didn't have a door on a hinge, you wouldn't open up. You'd have to pull it out the way. Everything, everything godly hinges on love. Now, let me remind you what real love looks like. I'll put this on the screen. It's found in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through the first of verse 8. It says, love is patient or it suffers long. Listen to that. Listen to that. Love will suffer. Love will suffer. Remember, we started this out by talking about the blood. That blood's poured out when you're suffering, right? Love suffers. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not, what, envy? It doesn't parade itself around. Look at me. It's not puffed up. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Look what I'm doing for them. Hey, don't forget what I've done for you. That's not love. That's not love. Love doesn't behave rudely. Does anybody uh, tell you they love you, but they're rude to you? <laughs> love does not seek its own. In other words, it's not selfish. Love is not provoked. Love doesn't need provoking. True love doesn't need provoking. It's already there. True love thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in sin or iniquity, but it rejoices in what, church? The truth. Love, I love this, love bears all. Love believes all. Love hopes all. Love endures all. Love never fails. We're talking about true love now. Okay? I, I've always put this definition at the, at the, in 1 Corinthians 13 in my Bible. I put in there that, that, that true love is seeking the greatest good for one another. That's what God did for us. You think about that. You listen. You think about Jesus when you read that. And then you ask yourself, man, does that sound like me? Sometimes I share this. And I'm going to share this uh, right now. There's, there's actually our English word for love does not do it justice. Because we can say we love some Twix. We love a whatchamacallit. We love chicken legs. But, but that's not the love of God. Okay, so let me just give these to you real quick. There's four Greek words. In other words, their, their language has four different uh, names for our one love. Okay, the first one I'll give you is eros. That's the Greek word eros. I bet you can figure out what, what that is. That's a, that's a romantic love. Hey, girl. Right? Eros. That's where they get the word erotic from. It's a romantic sexual type love. That's, that's eros. Now, can it be a part of a, 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 a relationship that, that has other love? Oh, absolutely. Hope so. Hope it does. Right? Storge is another. That's a Greek word that means a family-type love. It's a natural affection that comes in a family. You, you love your children, right? The other one is phile phileia. It's where you get the word Philadelphia from. That's a brotherly love or friendship-type love. But then you get to the God type of love, and you've heard this word, and you've seen it on businesses, but it's agape love. Agape love is unconditional love. Let me say that one more time. It's unconditional. There's no condition in God's love. 
No condition. It's a sacrificial type love. It's all in, right? Doing what Jesus would do, that's agape love. So when you talk about love, when he says here in verse 12, this has been the message from the beginning that we should love one another, he's not talking about jumping in the sack with them. He's not talking about patting them on the back and giving them an attaboy. He's talking about unconditional, sacrificial love. If your brother needs you, if your sister needs you, man, be there for him if you can. It's sacrifice. It's, it's, sac it's putting yourself on the back burner for those that you love. Make sense? All right, let's keep reading. For this message that we heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, here's the example, and we're going to go into this here in just a minute. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteousness. You see that? We're righteous. All right, verse 13. Don't marvel, my brothers, my brethren, if the world hates you. Okay, listen to that, what he just talked about. Gave us an example of Cain and Abel, and we're going to go look at this here in just a minute. But he murdered his brother because his brother was trying to walk in righteousness. Did you hear that? He, is that you would think, okay, if he'd have done something real bad. But he didn't do anything real bad. He served Jesus. And his brother killed him. But there's a reason why his brother killed him. Okay? And we're going to go into that in just a second. But look at verse 13. Do not marvel, my brethren, if this world hates you. Say that again. Don't, 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 don't go, be just shocked when you find out that there are folks in this world that you work with, that's in your family, that hate you. Because, help me out again, what's, what's the definition of world? A system that leaves God out. So when you read it like that, it says don't marvel if the system that leaves God out hates you. Okay? Don't miss that. Don't miss that. Okay? This, this right here, church, is a promise. This is a promise that evil hates good. This is a promise that those are on, that are on trying to do, on the path for Jesus, it's a promise that anybody that is led by the devil will hate you. It's a promise. It's right here in the Word of God. If you live for Jesus... That system that leaves Jesus out is going to hate you. Why, though? Why? Because the world is evil. That system is evil. If you leave God out, there's nothing. If you leave God out, man, you just left out your main thing. You just left, like, you, you think about if you were cooking a, uh, a good recipe. You were going to cook chicken and dumplings. But you left out the chicken and the dumplings. You see what I'm saying? It wouldn't work. It wouldn't work, would it? Why? Because you just left out the main thing. If you leave out Jesus, you're not going to enjoy your life. You think you may, you, you, you think you are, until you come to know Jesus, you realize I was way off. Right? There's something about peace and joy. <laughs> if you ain't got that, you ain't got nothing. And there's only one source of peace and joy, and that's Jesus. Right? So if you were going to eat some chicken and dumplings and you sat down to eat chicken and dumplings, there was nothing but a roux there. I mean, you could enjoy a little bit, a little soup maybe, but you ain't going to get what you came for. The world is not getting what they came for. And they don't realize it. It's in Jesus and they see it in us and they get mad at us. Because they see it in us. You do realize a lot of people that's mad at you, mad at you they want to be like you. People that hate you secretly usually want to be like you. Huh. What you say? See, the, the world, the, the world, you got to realize, they hate Jesus, but they can't touch Jesus. So what are they going to do? They're going to hate, hate the next best thing, and that's a believer in Jesus. Let me show you on the screen. John, verse 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 8. If the world hates you, this is Jesus speaking. You need to figure out how to turn them, them letters red sometime. That'd be cool, wouldn't it? If, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. You see that? Keep reading. If you were of the world, 
Listen, if you was of that system, remember being back in the system? You remember was you, surely you remember that. You remember you was in the system that left God out? Okay, what would happen? Well, that system would love you because you was part of that. Okay, but because you're not of this world, and I like how he pauses right here and says, I chose you out of the world. Isn't that good? Jesus said, Jesus said you're not of the world because I got you out of that mess. Yes, he did. He, he, got, he got us out of that mess. Uh-huh. Therefore, the world hates you because you ain't with them anymore. You ain't with them anymore. Make sense? So let's go to Genesis 4, and let's dig into this thing. Genesis 4, let's dig into this Cain and Abel story real quick. Get some more meat off this bone. It's going to show you right here how offense begins against God. A lot of people offended at God. So they identify with the system that leaves God out because they're offended, right? Okay, here we go. Genesis 4, everybody make it? Now Adam knew his wife Eve. He knew more than her name. They conceived and bore a child named Cain. She thought she'd had a man. She thought she'd had Jesus, but it wasn't. She just had a regular fella. Then she born again this time, his brother Abel. Now notice the difference in these two boys. Nothing wrong with either thing that these boys are doing. Abel was a shepherd. He was a keeper of the sheep. That's a, that's a good job. But Cain was a tiller of the ground, which is a good job. Okay? But watch this thing shift. In the process of time, verse 3. Now, if you write in your Bible, you can put right there uh, when he got around to it. In the process of time, when, 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 when Cain got around to it, he came and brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. He brought him some turnip greens. Or he brought him some pomegranate. Whatever you want to put in right there. He, brought, he, thought, he thought God needed a little pick-me-up. So he brought him some greens. Let's just say that. Lord, you're looking a little down. Let me bring you some greens. Okay. You think the Lord needed some turnip greens? Here we go. But Abel, verse 4, brought the firstborn of his flock and the fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. Look at verse 5. But he did not respect Cain. Now let's, let's just stop right there. And we went into this the other day, but we got we to rehash it because I want you to understand this, that what Abel did and what Cain did was total opposite. You got to realize that Abel brought his best of the best, no ticks, no cuts, all legs, all ears, right? Young, number one sh lamb to, the, to God, Okay? Okay, that lamb has a heart, and it's got blood running through it. It's alive. Okay, at one, at one point, he was probably petting it. And when he walked off from it, he'd say, bah. Okay, all right. So he brings that to the Lord and offers it as a sacrifice. Listen, he's coming for atonement for his sin. Don't miss the point here. He's coming for atonement. Like, he, he like, like, hey, I know I've messed up. Lord, take this lamb for my sin. That's why he's coming, okay? But Cain, on the other hand, is bringing turnip greens or pomegranates or apples for his sin. All right? You see the difference? There, there's, 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 a, there's, a huge, there's a huge difference. Because then you've got to ask yourself, well, where did Abel learn to bring a living sacrifice of the best of his best to God. Well, he, he, his mom and daddy told him. Okay? And you could go back to Genesis 3.21 and find this, that when his mom and daddy had sinned, God took a lamb, killed the lamb, and covered his mom and dad's nakedness with the skin of the lamb. Okay? So he learned from his mom and dad... 
the, and from God that if he wants to atone, do you remember what atonement means? At one mint, at one mint. You, you want, you're wanting to atone for your sins so you're at one with God again. Okay? So you're going to be with God again, and that sacrifice, that blood sacrifice of your perfect lamb, he didn't bring him the three-toed one, you know, the one with three legs. He didn't bring him the one that's, that had ticks all over him, skinny. He brought the best of the best. Why? Because you're bringing your best. Because, because God gives us his best. Okay? Is this making sense to y'all? Okay? This is agape love because it cost him something. It's sacrificial, right? There was a loss. All right? Think about Cain. He came to God for his sins when he got around to it. But, but what does it show when, when, you, when somebody brings you some tomatoes and somebody brings you some cucumbers? I mean, they're bringing you the fruit, right? But ultimately, they're really wanting to show you, hey, look at the work I put in because I tilled the ground, I pulled the weeds, I planted the seed, and man, look at my fruit. It, ladies, it's just like when, you, when, when, you, when your husband comes in from mowing the yard, he's like, look at that fruit, baby. Look at them lines. Didn't I do good? We like a little pat on the head sometimes, right? But it's like, it's like it's people are showing you, man, Look at my works. Look what I did, my toll, and look at the fruit I got from it. I'm sharing it with you. Isn't that a blessing when somebody shares that with you? Okay, that, that's, that's what uh, uh, a, uh, Cain is doing here to God. He's sharing his works. Work, and there's nothing wrong with this except he's trying to use what he worked and done to atone for his sin. Is that enough? Are y'all following me? Seriously. You got to get this. He's saying that, that what I've done with my hands and what I've accomplished on my own, I'm giving this to you, Lord, to atone for my sin. Is there anything that we can do out there that can work our way to heaven? Okay, that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to work his way to, to, for his sin to be forgiven. And that's not how it's done. How is our sin forgiven, church? The Lamb of God. He came, died for our sin. That's the only way. It's got nothing to do with works. Okay? This is the heart of God right here. You can't work your way to be accepted by God. All right? It's, it's all God that we're accepted by his sacrifice. Okay? Let, let, me, let me show you this verse again. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. It's by grace we have been saved. Through what? faith what is grace grace is getting what we don't deserve God gave us what we didn't deserve our salvation our forgiveness and he'll do that if we believe in him by faith make sense you've been saved by grace getting what you don't deserve but you've been saved through faith you've got to believe that Jesus is who he says he is to get salvation okay you got you got you got you, the, our part is to believe okay not of yourself. There's nothing that we done, Cain, right? Nothing of ourself. It is what? The gift of God, not of works, because anybody could boast. It, listen, somebody that feels better, for somebody that's younger, they can outwork you, mainly, if they want to, and if they're right mind. Now, I know some older folks that outwork the young folks. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, there comes a time that if somebody's younger and stronger, they can do more work. So just because you're younger and stronger and you live longer or whatever, and you, you think you can be ahead of somebody in heaven because of your works, look what I did, y'all. I dusted you. What about the guy in the wheelchair? What about the blind lady? You know what I'm saying? They, they, could, they, couldn't do, they couldn't do the works that this person does because they've been blessed with healthy lives. They can't do what they do. So, why, so that's why it ain't about works. You hear me, church? Now, don't get me wrong, there is a place for works, but it's not in salvation. Let me say that again. There's a place for works, it's not in salvation. You know where works come in at? When we're thankful. And then when we want to we wanna, uh, uh, carry the kingdom further. You know what I'm saying? Advance the kingdom of God. See, when, when you're thankful for God, you'll go out and do His work. When you want to advance, you know... The kingdom and what God is doing in the earth and, and, and what he's doing in your church and all. You, you, you got to put in some work to get that going. That's where work comes in. 
Let, let me just show you this. Let's hold, hold Genesis. Let's go to James 2 because I want you to understand this. There are so many people, there's these jacked up religions out there that think you can bake so many pies and get into heaven. You can build, help people cut yards, trim bushes, pull weeds, you know, to work themselves to God. A lot of them people riding them bicycles, coming knocking on your door, they got to knock on so many doors to be saved in their eyes. That's why they're not taking no for answer. And if they can lead you into their mess, they, they like get they they like get extra bonus points, like 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 if you was in Galaga or whatever. Or no, Pac-Man, and you and you got all the ghosts. You know what I'm saying? That, that's like it is. They honestly, if you ask them, they probably really don't care about you. They're just wanting to get them numbers. Wanting to get them numbers. They want to boast in them numbers. I beat you. I. Right? And they knocking on doors, telling them lies that the word of God is not enough. That you need to read the Book of Mormon. Uh, you feel me? This is real stuff. Let's go on this little rabbit trail right quick. James 2, verse 17. Everybody there? Okay, watch this, though, because there's a place for works. All right? Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. What you say? Listen, say that again. Faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. Okay? But someone will say, well, well, you have faith and, and I have works. Like this guy says, I got faith in Jesus. The other guy says, well, I got works. I've been doing a lot of stuff for folk. He says, show me your faith without works, and I'm going to show you my faith by my works. In other words, you can tell somebody loves Jesus because they're doing for Jesus. They're thankful. They're advancing the kingdom. You can see that they're doing kingdom work. They're doing Jesus' work. They just didn't give their life to Jesus and go on about their business. No, they actually believe what the Word says. And every day they're trying to get Jesus into their conversations. They're trying to find somebody to serve. They're trying to find somebody to give. They're looking for a need that, 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 can, that can, we can help out in. You see what I'm saying to you? He says, I will show you my faith by my Word. Watch this. 19. You believe that there's one God, you do well. <laughs> Anybody believe there's God? Even lost folks that think believe there's God. Watch this. Even the demons believe, though. Oh, they believe because God created them. They believe. They just reject him. But what does it do? It says they tremble. Remember the only ones that come out of that, that crazy man in the, in, the, in the cemetery? Jesus, don't, don't throw us in the pit yet. Don't throw us in the pit yet. Put us in the pigs. And he did. And the pigs went in the water. <laughs> right? The demons believe. The demons believe. Hey, anybody can believe. Oh, the man upstairs. Oh, I believe. Listen, anybody can say they believe. But you show me some fruit. You, you show me what's hanging off your tree. I can walk up in your house. You say, Brother Scotty, come over my house. Let me show you my pecan tree. I'm coming to see your pecan tree because I'm thinking maybe there may be a pecan pie at some point, right? And I come when it's time, when it's, har when it's harvest time and when they're growing on the trees, I come out there and all I see is leaves. Well, Brother Scott, that's a pecan tree right there. Really? Well, it ain't bearing any, it ain't got no pecans on it. Well, let me show you my apple tree back here. I go back and look at the apple tree. Well, it ain't no apples on it. How do I know it's an apple tree? How do I know if it's a pecan tree? If there's no fruit hanging off of it. You say, well, I'm a believer, Brother Scotty. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I love Jesus. I don't see that in your life. You see, you see, you see what I'm saying to you? I come to your work and say, hey, I'm uh, so-and-so's pastor. I'm here to take them to lunch. Pastor, they go to church? You know, they really go to church? You really go to church? <laughs> they go to church, man. That's not the answer you want. You feel me? Verse 20, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? He gives some examples. Were not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son to the altar? Y'all remember that story? Do you see the faith that was working together in his works? By works, but faith was made perfect. Scripture says, Abraham believed God, 
and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. Why? Because he had faith and works. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Like Rahab. Remember her? She hung, hung, uh, saved uh, the spies. Remember her? Watch verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. That's serious right there. A body without spirit is dead. You, you, remember, you, <laughs> we are a three-cylinder. All right? We are a spirit that possesses a soul, but we live in a body. You pull the spirit out of there, dead. You follow what I'm saying? That's how important it is faith and works go together. Don't be running around here telling everybody you believe in Jesus and not doing anything for him. Because he changes your life. Okay? You find out that you can be forgiven. All that mess we used to do, we can be forgiven. And one day be in heaven with the Lord. And we find out that the, the, the price for that was Jesus and his blood. We find out all that information. And then... Okay, we go on, we go on uh, gallivanting around, and, and we have a friend, and we hear him cussing like a sailor. We hear him cursing Jesus or, or, or acting a fool, uh, cheating on their wife or whatever. And, 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 and for us to hold on to that information and not tell them how we were set free. I ain't talking about just calling them out. It just depends on how well you know them, really. <laughs> tell them what happened to you. Because you say, hey, I used to do those things, but now I don't. And listen, I have peace and joy in my life. Let me t See, that's works. You, you're putting your faith to the, to, the, to, 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 the, to the grinding wheel. You know what I'm saying? That's where works comes in. I hope that made sense to you. Back to Genesis 4. I don't want you to leave here uh, hungry spiritually today, okay? If you leave here hungry, you're just not paying attention. Okay, verse 5. Genesis 4, verse 5. Everybody make it there? Y'all done gave up reading the screen, ain't you? But he did not respect Cain and his offering. Well, Cain was sad. His countenance fell. He got mad. So the Lord said to Cain, listen to this. Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fall? See, he... he Cain, here's, here's, before anything else happened, there's a great learning curve for his child Cain right here. I mean, he has the opportunity to learn from God what he did wrong and to do it right next time. But how come we get all stirred up when, when, we, when, when there's criticism? I'm, I'm talking about healthy criticism. Sometimes we can get so mad... And so angry, write everything off and miss the lesson. I'm guilty. We miss the lesson because we get stirred up. And I think that's where the pride comes in. If we would humble ourselves and say, man, you that's right. I ain't going to make that mistake again. But we never humble ourselves. And then we do like Cain. Watch, watch, watch the snowball effect right here. God said, if you do well, won't you be accepted? And if you not do well, then sin's lying right there at the door to get you. And its desire is for you. But listen, you should rule over that mess. Seek God's will. Cain talked with Abel. They was out in the uh, pasture. I bet you... You know, Cain was probably out there uh, working, his, working his field. And Abel probably come out there to, to probably console him a little bit, try to talk to him about what just happened. Reckon? It's like, hey, brother, man, you know, get you, get you a lot. You know, this, something's, got a, something's got a cost here. You know, he's probably teaching him what he should do, right? His brother. But Abel killed him. Cain rose up and Abel's brother. Cain killed his brother Abel. Cain killed Abel, not Abel killed Cain. So then the Lord said to Cain, I want you to watch this. Tell me if this is, doesn't sound like somebody that's offended to God and a smart aleck. Where is Abel your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? 
you telling God, God is wanting you to hold your brother accountable. And he comes to ask you where your brother is. He says, am I my brother's keeper? Actually, you are. We should hold each other accountable. I wonder if God, God does that to us. We look and say, man, look, look who's missing here today. Look who's missing here today. Look who's missing on Sunday. Look who you hadn't heard from lately. And God says, hey, do you know where so-and-so is? Am I their keeper? Are you a brother and sister in Christ? You checked on them yet? Huh? It's kind of like that. We get smart, Alec, because we're angry at God. Verse 10 says, what have you done? He said, the voice of your brother cries out to me from the ground. Mm -mm -mm. Smart mouth, offended. So if, 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 if somebody's smart mouth and offended at God, then where is he going to take his anger out? Because you can't take it out on God. I mean, the only thing you can do to God is like just not go to church anymore, not drive by a church, not ever pick up a Bible, never pray, just get mad at God. Okay? The best way to get back at God, ask the devil, is to get at his people. You agree with that? The best way for, for, for the devil to get at God is through his people. And the same thing with the devil's offspring, get back at God's people. That's why the devil's in their ear. Can you believe what they did to you? Get them. Sick them. Sick them. That's what he does. That's what he does. Remember, remember where offense starts. Offense is rooted in unmet expectations. Have you learned that one yet? Where there's expectation that's not met, then offense comes in. Especially for those that you love the most. So Cain expected God to be okay with his offering and his half-stepping. But he wasn't, was he? Mm -mm, he got offended. Church, listen to me. If we're not careful, this same thing can happen to us. If, 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 if we get so uh, high and mighty and we think that God should respond to our every prayer request according to your will and not his, you can get offended at God. Oh, yes, you can. You can get offended at God. How silly does that sound? Let me just give you one. John the Baptist. It's the greatest example. The whole reason for John the Baptist to be alive is to be the front runner of Jesus. He come up out the woods. It says he was eating locusts and honey. He, he wore camel hair. I mean, this was the Bible's redneck right here. Okay? He come up out of the woods preaching Jesus. He started baptizing people in the name of Jesus. Jesus wasn't on the scene yet. But he's baptizing people in the name of Jesus, telling everybody to turn to Jesus. People start following John the Baptist. He says, don't follow me. I'm not even worthy to untie Jesus' shoe. He says, when he comes, all the attention goes on Jesus. So what does he do? The day that Jesus shows up, he hollers and tells everybody, look, Jesus, the son of the living God. Listen, he calls him this. He calls him this. He says, he's the lamb of God, <clears throat> lamb of God, lamb of God. That takes away the sin of the world. That's what he said. He hollered out, hey, y'all, there's Jesus, the Lamb of God. What does he do? He's the one that takes away the whole sin of the world. And then something happens, crazy happens. Jesus comes to John and says, hey, will you baptize me? John the Baptist said, no, I, you baptize me. Jesus said, no, you baptize me. Okay. So he baptizes Jesus, and when Jesus comes up out of the water... The Bible says the Spirit of God fell on him like a dove. We're talking about John the Baptist hollering about Jesus, Lamb of God. He took Jesus under and saw the, 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 the dove light on his head. Then, if that wasn't enough, he heard, This is my son who I am well pleased with. Where'd that come from? Who said that? That come from up yonder. God said, in an audible voice, Jesus is his son, and he's well pleased with him. Okay. Okay, John. All right. So does that sound like a good, good example 
Okay. Well, let's look at the screen. Matthew 11. Okay, let me tell you what happens. John the Baptist is preaching Jesus, finds himself in jail, and is wondering, where's the one that sets the captive free? Then, he, then, then the enemy gets in his mind and says, well, Jesus may not be the Messiah, may not be the one. You know, devil, you're probably right. So John has disciples, and he, takes his, he tells his disciples, he says, I want you to go, and I want you to go see Jesus and ask him if he's the one. Is this making any sense, church? Let's just read it. He said to him, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? <laughs> Jesus, are you the one or is there another one? How, how, what makes a person not hear and forget the voice of God? What makes a person forget that they're created <laughs> to front run for Jesus? Jesus answered and said, You go tell John the things that you hear and see. Now watch this. If he's not the one... Okay, let's see if he can do these things. Verse 5. The blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, deaf hear, dead people are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. That's what's going on right now, if you don't think I'm, I'm the Messiah. Oh, and by the way, John, I know what's going on with you. Uh, blessed is he who is not offended at me. <laughs> you see it? By the way, all this is going good. It's awesome. God is doing mighty things. Blessed are those who are not offended at me for it. See, I believe that John could not understand why God's will was for him to be in prison and ultimately have his head cut off and put on a platter. Well, he died for Jesus. You got to realize, John come around from this. John... There, Jesus says this of John, that there was no other greater, greater man born by woman than John. So don't be hard on John. In his weakness, he wasn't thinking right. He was offended at God. What you say? Think about it. So my point is this. It's easy to get offended at God if we're not careful. So we're living in a system that leaves God out and they're offended at God and most people don't even know why they're offended at God. They're just following those ahead of them. Okay, but here's my whole question tonight. All right, here's my whole question. Since we live in this world which is dominated by the system that leaves God out, make sense? Since we live in it, and, and it says the world will hate us that are living for Jesus and in righteousness. If the world, the world hates us, that means that at most turns and most valleys and most mountains, we're going to run into people that hate us. Okay? What should we do about it? Because I don't know about you, but when I run into somebody that's cussing me for everything I know, Somebody that wants to bust me upside the head. What I mean, what seriously, church, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? How are you gonna how are you gonna respond to the pushback and the hate of this message that we're carrying out here today? Are we gonna be our own Avengers? We're not called to be Avengers, are we? Remember, what was the difference between the children of God and the children of the devil? Love. Oh, this ain't easy. This ain't easy. Go to 1 Peter 3. Go back to the back of your Bible. Or follow it on the screen. But I do encourage you, the more you flip, the more you find, the more you learn. 1 Peter 3. Listen, our, our neighbor may hate us, but you ain't got to hate them back. Oh, I know that's hard. Y'all quiet. First Peter 3. Let's start in verse 8. I'm going to read you 10 verses right here. I want you, this is, this is what I want you to really, really, really let soak in on you. 
finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Well, we can just, we can just stop right there, right? <laughs> Not returning evil for evil. Reveling for reveling. But on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you were called to this. That you may inherit a blessing. You do realize that's what we're called to. He who would love life and see good days. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to the prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will do harm if you become followers of what is good? <laughs> But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you're blessed. Do not be afraid of their threats or their trouble. Watch this. Sanctify, set apart the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Do you hear? Instead of being ready to... To, to defend yourself. No, it says be ready to give a defense for the hope that you have in you. Because you do realize when somebody's angry and ticked off, it, sometimes that's a good opportunity. Because when you respond in a way that is not like they're responding, you, you, you usually have their full attention. Just say, listen, let me tell you what Jesus is doing in my life. Now, nine times out of ten, here's what they're going to do. But soft answer, good answer, right answer turns away wrath. Verse 16, have a good conscience that when they defame you, talk mess about you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than doing evil. Stop right there. Do you see it? Because if we, if we engage and we become our avenger, then is there consequence to that sin? Anybody? Yeah. There's consequence to that sin if we become our avenger. Okay? So how about not avenge, let the Lord have it, and be rewarded, it, even if you get pounded on. <laughs> Listen, you got to hear what I'm saying. If you're trying to protect your family or trying to stop somebody from killing you, that's a whole different... I'm, you know what I'm talking about here, okay? You know what I'm talking about. You ain't supposed to be all sissy man, sissy girl, right? You, you, you got to protect, but you know when the Lord's telling you not to, when he will avenge you. But it's better to suffer for doing good because that person is blessed. And you say, well, who in the world would do that? Well, look at verse 18. Christ suffered once for sin for the just and the unjust that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit do you get do you understand that right there that hey they bust him in the mouth pulled out his beard and his hair nailed him to the cross beat him beyond human resemblance and he not retaliated one time because he knew he had to go to the cross. He knew that had to happen if we were ever, ever. So you want to talk about suffering? Don't talk about suffering. You, you, you look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. That's some heavy stuff right there. Amen? All right, well, I'm going to close right here. Go to Luke 7. We'll close. We'll be done right here. Y'all can get to the house, get you some rest. This word too good not to share. What I'm saying, we're, you're going to encounter it at work. You're going to encounter it at restaurants. You're going to encounter it in places that you don't even expect to encounter this kind of mess. But you got to be re ready to defend yourself as, a, as of giving a reason of the hope that's in you. That's the main thing. That's the main thing. You got, you, you, listen, you ain't living in a world that hates you. And before you say there's more of us than there is them, think back up at the parable where Sir Jesus says that there is a narrow road 
and few find it that go to life. But there's a wide road that leads to destruction, and many go down that road. So we're looking at the, 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 the few and the many, okay? Few and the many, we're the few, right? All right, watch this. We're going we're gonna to be doing right here. 36, 736. So one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. Come over to the house, Jesus. So he went to the Pharisee's house. He sat down to eat. Behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner. Everybody knew this girl. You read between the lines. She's a, she's a woman of the city Okay, who was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus was at the table at that old boy's house, she brought an alabaster flask of, of fragrant oil. Okay, stop right there. You got to realize these prostitutes used oil. They didn't have, you know, they didn't raise their hand if they were sure. Okay, they, they, you know, they would be, you know, and then they'd put oil all over them. You know, you know what I'm saying? They, they would they'd put oil on their bed. And I, you just have to go back and read how, how all they did that in the day. The oil, that, that flask that she has is very expensive, smelled very good, cover up, cover up any funk. Okay, so when you look at that jar, you're looking at really a cycle of sin that she's in. Make sense? So you look at that, you look at that jar, that's a cycle of sin. Okay, but she's bringing this cycle of sin to see Jesus. Okay, now, now you got to realize she ain't trying to talk Jesus into action. Okay, she's coming for forgiveness. Okay? She's tired of her lifestyle. She heard the only one that could forgive her is eating with this old boy today. This Pharisee. Remember the Pharisee is a religious man? Religious leader supposed to have it all together? All right. Y'all follow, y'all follow, follow the story? Verse 38. She stood at his feet. Behind him weeping. Why is she crying? She began to wash his feet with her tears. Now picture this. And she wiped them with her hair of her head. She kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. (laughs) If If you read this, most of the Gospels have this story. She pours all the oil on Jesus. That expensive oil that she uses in her cycle of sin was just poured and given to Jesus, poured on Jesus. She wept, okay, and she wiped his feet. She realized that his feet were dirty, and she cleaned his feet with her own hair. Okay, here's what you got to realize. Jesus' feet shouldn't have been dirty. Because he was, he, he was asked to come over to this guy's house, okay? And when you come in a house and you're a guest, first thing they do right by the door is, some, is, a, is a bowl of water. Wash the feet. They wash and clean the feet of the guest. Come on in. Go read about it. Come on in. But Jesus' feet's dirty. The Pharisee, the religious guy, supposed to have it all together, pretty much disrespected Jesus as he come in with dirty feet. But this girl, seeing that he had dirty feet, She wanted to serve him in the best way she possibly could. So she bends over to clean his feet. She doesn't have water, but she has her oil, her expensive high-dollar oil. Cleans his feet with oil. She doesn't have a, 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 a towel, so she uses her hair. You ever clean somebody's feet with your hair? But while she's doing this, She's weeping because of her sin. Picture that. Now when the Pharisee, verse 39, had invited him and saw this, he spoke to himself saying, they couldn't couldn't hear him. He's talking to himself right here. Probably to his buddies there in there. This man, if he were a prophet, if he was really Jesus, if he was really the Messiah, he would know who and what manner of woman is who this is touching him. She's a sinner. You see him over the corner? He just knew who she was. 
he, each of them run. He doesn't have a clue. That man doesn't have a clue who Jesus is, does he? Does that sound like the Jesus you know? We, we're, we are imperfect people bringing him a perfect gift. I, ho I hope you see that. We're, we're, we're imperfect people. Whatever sacrifice you bring to the Lord, whether it's your worship, whether it's your time, whether it's your, 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 your money, your gifts, your service, whatever it may be, we're imperfect people, but we're giving him what he deserves. We're giving him for giving him what he deserves. He deserves it all. So this woman and and Abel are really a picture of us, imperfect people, who's bringing him a perfect gift. Abel brought the lamb. This lady is bringing her cycle of sin, laying it at his feet. And her offering is her tears and her service to the Lord. Perfect. Because he deserves it, right? Let's just finish that story. We can't leave it hanging. Jesus said to Simon, this is, this is the guy's house. I have something to say to you, teacher. He said, teacher, tell it. So he gives a little parable right here. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. Who knows 500 more than 50? Okay. When he had nothing to repay... He freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon says, I suppose the one who, whom he forgave more of, the one that had the 500, right? He said, yeah, you've rightly judged. So he turns to the woman. Watch this. He, tur he turned to the woman, but he was talking to Simon. <laughs> he says, do you see this woman? I entered your house, your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I got here. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. That's another thing they do for guests, anoint them with oil on the head. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven for she is loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, that loves little. So he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Would you just listen to this? This is so beautiful because you got this guy that thinks he has it all together and he didn't do anything for Jesus because he felt like it wasn't nothing wrong with him. But the woman that knew she was a sinner, what did she do? She gave it all. She gave it all. Guys, this is a picture of us right here. Those that love much. Listen, listen, listen. Before you not love your enemy, before you not love this world that hates you, before you stop and say, no, I'm not going to love, just remember that you have been forgiven much, so therefore we should love much. So those that sit at the table, verse 49, begin to say to themselves, Who is this that forgives sins? But again, he looks at that woman and he says, Sweetie, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. P-E-A-C-E. -E. That's just what he do. Isn't it? Has he told you to go in peace? Anybody? You know, there's more noises at funerals than in here today. So the question on the table is, are you loving much? Are you loving much? Has anybody in here been forgiven much? We need to go love much. Amen. Father, thank you for this time. Lord, I pray you put energy in your people and give them rest tonight. Lord, let us, uh, I pray, let us ponder over this word and let it hit, let it hit us. Lord, don't, don't let, our, don't let our, our physical bodies, weaknesses block us from your word. 
Let us take this home and let us let us pour over it. And let us see you even more. Let us see your heart even more. Lord, I pray you bring people in our path that, that not necessarily look like those we normally love home. So we can have an opportunity to love like you love. Lord, I thank you for meeting with us today. And it's in your powerful name, in the name of Jesus Christ, that we pray. The church said amen. 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 Thank you all for coming.